this is a picture of an orthokeratology lens on top of a cornea and the fluorescing pattern down beneath. So I want to talk about a few things. The first thing is the base curve. The base curve in a orthokeratology lens is a reverse geometry, which means it's flatter than the cornea. So here would be essentially the base curve. Then there's the reverse curve, right? So the reverse curve is here, which is basically, it's called a reverse curve because it's supposed to, a normal gas permeable lens would be the same, relatively the same curvature as the cornea, but it's reverse because it's actually going to be steeper this area than the cornea. And then we have the alignment curve where the lens is, lens is basically tangent to the cornea, lens softly there. And then you have the peripheral curve here at the very last part of it, where you get that little bit of green at the very end. In general, how orthokeratology works is that the central base curve is flatter than the cornea. So let's say you have a 43 cornea, the base curve might be like 40. If you're trying to flatten by three diopters or so. It's a closed system. So how it works is this area is going to create a seal here where it lands at the alignment curve, which causes a sort of a negative suction force. So what happens is the cells migrate out in and in to out there to fill this space here. That's essentially what orthokeratology does. The goal is actually if we're not to bear very much on the corner. If there's a lot of corneal bearing, you might get SPK. The goal is actually just to create this negative suction by making a closed system in the cells migrate here by suctional force. I don't like to think uh, orthokeratology smushes on the central cornea very much more that it just creates this suctional force to pull away from the in the periphery. So this is what happens to the cornea afterwards. So when you have a lens like this and the cells migrate from in, out, and out, in, you get a flatter cornea. So let's say this is an example of a patient who is a minus five prescription. There's actually one of my texts that works for me. And what happens is the central cornea gets flatter by about five doctors. And then what happens here is in the red wing, it gets steeper there by about five doctors than the original cornea. So if you look at it this way, it kind of matches one to one with the fluorescein pattern in the blue outside here, where the steeper red part is would correspond to the green color here. So you're wondering where the topography, how it matches the fluorescein patterns like that. And then the center part is where the, the base curve is and then be the middle here. What happens is that if this is a minus five, you get like a minus minus five in the middle in terms of treatment. And here you might get like a plus five, which you can actually do by getting a difference map and clicking on this part of the difference map. And it'll actually tell you the difference between your topography afterwards, after doing orthokeratology versus the original cornea. And you actually see that's a minus five plus five if you click on it. What happens is minus five in the middle is you'll have the treatment basically hit the macula, but where it's plus five here in the peripheral cornea, that's where it will land in front of the retina. This is a, a, an eyeball lights coming in this way. Light going through the middle might land here, hitting the peripheral corner might land in front of the retina. And it's that, that, it's that peripheral defocus that gets you that myopia management. The ideal candidate that I find in terms of lifestyle is myopic children. And the main reason that drives it, and you'll find this if you talk to a lot of orthopedic practitioners, the majority of our patients actually ends up being myopia management patients and they, they're children who have myopic progression. That's at least 80% of what I do. The other 20% are definitely adults. I do hyperopic orthokeratology as well and plenty of adults and I've done everything, but but still the majority is myopic patients. That's your ideal candidate. As far as prescriptions to watch out for, you know, once you get really good, you can do honestly anything. You can do a minus 10, you can do a plus three, you can do three doctors a cylinder, but I wouldn't do that starting off, if you, especially if you're doing just your few first cases. And this is orthokeratology 101 for those just getting started. I would aim for these patients that are low myops, minus one to minus six is a good range. With the rule is easier than against the rule. Astigmatism, K virus 40 to 46, though we'll talk about later on, the eccentricity is more important than the K virus. And then the eccentricity, which is the rate of flattening 0.3 to 0.7. These are just kind of general guidelines. So if you do a consultation and you're like telling a patient, you're a good candidate, I think, <laughs> keep these things in mind. And, and if they hit all these criteria, they're probably a good candidate. In general, the base curve, that's responsible for the central flattening. In orthokeratology, it's going to be flatter than the original cornea. The reverse curve is steeper than the original cornea that creates that area where the cells suck into. The alignment curve is similar to the curve of the cornea. It's where the lens is supposed to gent gently land on the eye. And then the peripheral curve is for tear exchange. Poor candidates would be people who have really high astigmatism, weird oblique axes, really flat or large corneas, crazy analytic expectations. That's why kids do so well is because they are very easy. They, they don't have unrealistic expectations because with orthokeratology, sometimes you have days where it can fluctuate. If there are mismatches in the refractive cylinder and the corner cylinder due to, let's say, internal astigmatism, poor canon as well. Of course, there's also these absolute contraindications. You would never do on a patient with keratoconus. This is a patient with keratoconus with intacts, keratoconus, corneal transplants, post-lasic. Have I done post-lasic? I've done one or two only because they really wanted me to do it. And did it 
go well? Yeah, it, it actually went really well, but I don't recommend it. It's hard to do. And I, I don't think I'll do any going forward, actually. I just want to do a couple, but don't recommend it. So the contraindication would be a keratoconus, of course, coronary transplants, any strange diseases, active coronary infections, inflammation in the anterior chamber, very severe dry eyes, any condition that is made worse by current lens where you want to just avoid those ones because you don't you don't have to do orthokeratology. Even for microwave mandarin, you could just do you know atropine instead, for instance. In general, this is what happens after orthokeratology. So on the, the topography on the left is just a normal pre-treatment cornea. Nothing has happened. On the right, it's a perfect example of perfect treatment. A nice centered treatment, a nice red ring, bullseye, no looseness. Patient was a minus five. They were plano in actually one day. The picture on the right is a subtractive map. So this is the first pre-treatment topography. This is the topography afterwards. The difference map is what matters in terms of what has happened to the corner afterwards. So when you're working with your labs, they're going to need to see a difference map because it tells you where the lens was actually landing and what's going on. In this situation, that obviously it matches the post okay topography where you have the central flattening. You can click on this. You'd find if this if you're treating five doctors, you'd click in the middle and you'd find it's five doctors different. Here you'd see five doctors steeper, for instance. Here you'd see it flatter as well. Here you technically see in the periphery, it's a little bit steeper. So maybe the lens was actually a little a bit steeper in the proof. If we had to fix something, we might flatten the alignment curve a little bit. In general, know that when you're doing orthokeratology, think of it like, you know that classically a minus lens looks like this and a plus lens looks like this. So let's say this is a normal corner looking, looking over here. With orthokeratology, you're going to flatten the center and then steepen. So you're flatten the center, but you're going to steepen the peripheral corner. So basically what happens if, at a side view is you're going to exaggerate, but this is the, <laughs> this is the corner after orthokeratology, basically. Essentially, what you're doing is you're making a minus lens on the cornea. And so that minus lens is essentially what you're doing with the cartilage. You're, you're, you're making a concave surface on the eye in a way compared to the original cornea. This is an example of minus five, but sometimes I've taught dozens and dozens, maybe over hundred doctors at this point had to do orthokeratology. Know that when you get the map, sometimes they don't look clean. Like, like this nice red wing, I've had my students say, it doesn't look clean. I, sometimes it's not clean. And a lot of that has to do with also even just how much you're treat, treating. So for instance, this is a minus 250 patient. This person is seeing 2020, by the way. The, 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 it's perfect treatment, patient's happy, everyone's high-fiving each other. But obviously you don't get that nice, nice red wing on this one because you have just less tissue to move. If you're doing like a minus one, sometimes you're, you're gonna barely see much, any difference at all. And, but the patient's going to be 2020 20 and happy and uh, plain or, or fraction. So know that you don't always get those clean red wings. It's totally fine. I like to give loaner glasses if their patient is, uh, you know, in the middle of treatment. So let's say at the one day follow up patient is still like a minus three because they used to be a minus six. I don't like to give, if I can, you know, I will, if I have to, but I try not to give too many temporary soft contact lenses just because, you know, then the patient's wearing a like, soft contact lens all uh, wearing a hard lens at nighttime and then they wake up with a soft lens all day long. They're basically in a lens 24 hours a day. I'm like, yeah, I don't even like that. We have these loaner glasses. We edge in office and we just, we have a bunch of minus two, threes, fours, and we just give them the patients to tie them over for, for one or two nights. When to consider torque orthokeratology lenses. In general, if you look at the eight millimeter cord, if there's more than 30 microns of elevation differences in the principal meridians, that's when you should think about uh, orthokeratology. Remember, it's not about the keratometry values as much as it is the difference in the, in the elevation at the eight millimeter cord of the principal meridian. So just use your topographer, click on that part. And let's say it has like, you know, 4,000 there. Another one's just 30 microns more than uh, consider a torque lens. Dimple veiling, some, I, I see this sometimes actually. It, it can happen. Usually the lens is too tight. So you need to just flatten the lens out. Sometimes it can just go away on its own. So you don't need to change very much. Just to kind of monitor it. Lens sometimes can bind and get a little tight. And so if it's hard to remove, I like to have the patients use a little bit of artificial tears right before they take the lens out and kind of just try to break suction with their eyelids. If if not, I say we can redesign the lens. Uh, you can make the edge lens edge a little bit thicker maybe, or you can loosen the peripheral curves. But usually, honestly, most of the time, just by having them wet their eyes and break suction with their eyelids, that's usually usually enough. In general, this is how a lens should look ideally, right? So this is the, the red's base curve. The green is, uh, sorry, the blue is the reverse curve. The pink is the landing curve. This is an example of a perfect fit. These six situations down below encompass most of what can go wrong. Essentially, a lens is too loose here. So if you can find out which one went wrong with your case, you can fix it almost every time. You just have to find out which one of these six problems on the bottom that probably encompasses 95% of things that could go wrong, which one it is. If you do, you're going to do just fine. So in this situation, the lens is too loose. I'm going to increase the sag at the blue or pink. This one here, the landing is good, but the reverse curve is too tall. So the lens is too, too high. This one here, the reverse curve is good. The alignment curve is too flat. I would steep in here. This one, the alignment curve is too flat and the reverse curve is too tall. This one here, too steep at the landing 
at the alignment curve, uh, reverse curve might be okay. This one here again too steep at the uh, too too steep at the alignment curve might want uh, and, or and I might want to steepen the reverse curve. Here's a little case example: is a minus four patient, minus one axis 160. Basically, you got it pretty good with the first lens, but I got a little bit of withdrawal astigmatism left over, so I wanted to clean that up. So how do I clean that up? You see how it's a little bit of green here? So the lens is still a little bit loose up and down. I would say, okay, well I'm looking at the difference map. So on the right, it's a difference map. That's the most important part. So I look at the difference map. Okay, yeah, look, I'm looking here at the, it's a nice difference here. It's landing right there. It was it was blue there, blue spot here. Up and down there, I see a little bit red here, still red right there. So I would say, hey, hmm, looking here, it's probably number three or maybe number six, vertically at least, horizontally, it's fine. That's why you've still a little bit of with the wall cylinder left over. Vertically, it was not treated as much. And so you need to have more treatment vertically to add more minus power, right? So I'm thinking, think, okay, I'm going to basically um, steepen the lens. What I did in this situation was I thought it was, I steepened the blue and I flattened the pink to bring the lens down to land here to the ideal fit. And then we got it basically patient. Now you notice how the, the green color on the bar view kind of went away up and down. See that? Now it's kind of blue. All I did was change the vertical meridian, by the way. I made a quadrant specific change up and down only. Not I didn't change anything side to side and I left the side size alone. And then the lens now centers better and also the treatment is better as well. Patients, all the stigma is gone. Patient is plano. In general, for myopia management, you want smaller treatment zone. So the treatment zone for myopia management, remember the point of myopia management is not to flatten the central cornea. The reason to do myopia management orthokeratology is actually to steepen the cornea. That's what you actually care about. The vision is the side benefit of doing myopia management actually. So you actually want to make sure this uh, steeper part, the red, is within their pupil so you can get that peripheral defocus. So the goal, that's the treatment zone. It, inv it includes for myopia management that red ring. For adults on the right here, I designed a lens that was larger. I, I maxed out the the base curve, I made a really wide optic zone and then just in a real thin reverse curve. And so for a patient, you, you wouldn't care about my rear management. You'd want to just have all that red wing outside the pupil. Checking for my progression. Of course, the best way is axial length. My ideal goal is less than 0.1 millimeters per year is perfect. But ultimately though, anything more than 0.2 millimeters a year, and I usually check every three months. That's a little bit too fast. So I'm looking, I'm checking those rates. If you don't have axial length, what you can do is and you don't want the patient to wash out of orthokeratology. You can have them put on the lens and do a over refraction. If you get more minus, that can indicate myopic progression. Granted, there should be, if, if in the absence of lens warpage. Mm -hmm.